Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the See and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. Warren, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Don. I appreciate uh, being offered the this opportunity. Indeed. Uh, so w- what are you currently working on? Um, well, I just finished uh, taking a course with a friend of mine down here, uh, studying different types of acrylic mediums. Mm. As you know, I uh, paint almost strictly with oil, although I did start when I started painting, I started painting with acrylic only. But in the last 15 years, acrylic mediums have become really interesting. And so I decided to take a look at what he was doing and uh, found some really interesting things. So I spent a couple of days with him and we had a really good time uh, doing it. Uh, that's so awesome. that's what I'm doing. Uh, that is part of what we, what I would call faux encaustic stuff, which a lot of people study encaustic, which is dealing with uh, beeswax, refined hmm. beeswax and things like that. And that will lead you into it if you want to go there. And we did do some of that too, but um, primarily that's what we did. Wow. Uh, so when you said down here, what, what, what do you mean? Like where, where uh, is I'm, down here? I'm, my studio is on Cape Cod in Truro. Oh, nice. Nice. And so, and, uh, uh, mm-hmm. My friend's studio is in Provincetown. Uh, so I spent a couple of days in Provincetown just before 4th of July, spending time. And there it was a really hot weather. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, that's what it was brutal. Uh, um, is, that's up in Massachusetts, everywhere? right? Right. Okay. Nice. Yeah, last week was uh, it was brutal. I swear you could like cook eggs on the sidewalk or something. Oh yeah, it's um, really hot. But this weekend it broke, and uh, it's just, yesterday was incredibly gorgeous. I, I don't know if it was where you were at. Yes, it was. It was incredibly gorgeous here too. Just beautiful. It's nice. first day, and today is just as just the another one, which is really great. Yeah, let me look out my window. Yep, it's there. <laughs> uh, we went camping. Uh, uh, my family tends to go camping um, the week before and after Fourth of July, and uh, so I had the kids up there for the whole week with. Uh, the grandparents and cousins and all that stuff. And then I went up mm-hmm. on Friday and um, uh, we left very early this morning because it's about a three hour car drive. So uh, I was like, I gotta get back. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the weekend was, was, uh, was gorgeous up in the woods and out on the, on the Creek there. Um, so in terms of uh, painting, um, you, besides like exploring this new uh, acrylic uh, techniques and, and uh, I'm assuming the products are different, the acrylic p- paints themselves are, are, are different. The paints uh, aren't that different, but the products that you can use with them are different. Uh, they're uh, basically filler products that uh, are different viscosities and things like that, that have different um, additives to them uh, that make them kind of interesting. So you can get texture. You can get a different texture, a different look that way. Okay, that's cool. Like some of the, like putting sand and things like that in, into the. Yeah, thing. you know, yeah, you could say that. You could say sand. Uh, you could say uh, some people used to use marbles, uh, marble dust, and things like mm. that. Or there were all kinds of additives to thicken up paint and to make it um, more heavier. They they have some for oils as well. It depends on what kind of an effect you really think you can get with it. Yeah, that's cool. And, and when you're not doing that, what kind of work are you typically doing? I typically am a, an oil painter at this point. I paint uh, oil on canvas, uh, an oil on panel. Um, and I, 
I just had a show opening uh, Friday night up here at one of the um, local galleries on right on Route 6A uh, in Truro oh. itself. And, Congratulations. Uh, also, yeah, and I also belong to a, a local painting group that called the Truro Group uh, that had an opening in the library here. So I, I try to get my name out. I'm basically an Outer Cape painter. Although okay. I, I spend winters in Northern California and uh, I paint out there. And one of the reasons I moved out there was to paint in the wintertime. I was fortunate enough to be able to do it. It wasn't easy, but I have two children that also live out there. So oh, it's, nice. it's a good reason to get time. out there. Yeah, we go camping and stuff like that together. So I love, I love to go camping myself. So cool. I, can, I can appreciate what you're talking about. Now, or, or are you originally from California? No, I'm actually, I grew up in, um, I was born and grew up, uh, spent my first seven years in Waterbury, Connecticut. Oh, okay. So you're yeah. a, a Northeasterner. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm really a kind of a New Englander and then went to school in New York and Philadelphia. And, and so my wife is from New York. So we lived in New York a long time. Cool. And so what, what, what did you go to school for? Um... I was on this track. Uh, <laughs> I um, I studied uh, biology and chemistry and ended up going to uh, the University of Pennsylvania and got a degree in uh, Doctor of Dental Medicine mm -hmm. and then ended up uh, in the armed forces because it was the end of the Vietnam War. And when I got out of that, I came back and got a degree in public health and maternal and child health, things like that. And um, I've always been on that kind of a track, but I'm, I'm retired from that now. I'm in a different world completely. I used, I've been painting for well over 25 years, wow. started out really in sculpture and, um, then switched over once I got the bug about oils, uh, and, and color, uh, it changed everything for me. Mm. Um, so yeah. So you got in a sculpture. Is that was that an extension from the dent? The dent yeah, that was that was a bit of an extension from the three dimensional mindset of doing that because everything is very three dimensional and upside down and backwards and things like that. And I, I have a great facility for three dimensional things. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's very cool. Um, I. I I once had a job as a an articulator, like working mm -hmm. for a dentistry place, like a laboratory. Yeah. And um, and I was like, oh man, this is so cool! Like I, I wanted it to be, uh, you know. I was like, I think I found my medium, <laughs> like just working in the stone uh, plaster yeah. type of stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, so uh, yeah, so I can see where someone you know who's creative and uh, wants to explore would would maybe get into sculpture at first. So like, how did you then to you, you, you're in the sculpture world, but then like, how did you transition or stumble into the, the painting? Well, I had my mother uh, painted. We didn't come from a very, uh, we came from a kind of a poor family. We lived on the second floor walk up in Waterbury and my mom would paint out on the, uh, um, on the porch that, mm -hmm. uh, the landing area leading up to our apartment. And uh, that's how I first got introduced to oil painting when I was a kid. Mm. And then by around age 11, we had, we, they built their own house finally and moved out of Waterbury. They moved out to a suburban town, which has had a lot of dairy farms and stuff like that. So uh, I really grew up in a small area, small house like that. And uh, eventually in school became very attracted to uh, art in that way. Um, would you know finish my math as quickly as possible so I could get to the art <laughs> and I mm -hmm. got you know chosen to do murals and things like that so it's always been in my life but then you go through some kind of formal education you kind of get away from it you don't have time so when I finally started working again uh, regularly I would take courses at night uh, to go out and do it and the transition happened because I was doing sculpture I did a couple of took a sculpture course in college and then took it from there out on my own and started with clay. And actually, when I was in dental school, I made a couple of death masks of my wife. I made her lie down and put Vaseline all over her face. 
through some of that plaster you've been, you worked with on mm-hmm. her <laughs> and um, made some, I was into doing stuff like that. Um, and so I was always into that. And then suddenly I, it was, I, I tried a couple of pieces of marble mm-hmm. and uh, actually went up to this uh, quarry in Vermont. And uh, then I began to see these guys were working with pneumatic chisels up there. And I began to see how ridiculous it was for me to be doing this like Michelangelo. You know, I had read his his book, you know, The Agony and the Ecstasy and all that stuff. And I was really into it. And we had been to Italy once and had been, seen a lot of his stuff. Uh, and Henry Moore and uh, Brancusi and people like that. So I was mm-hmm. that's how I really started. But once I got into color... Um, the color kind of stimulates when you get into color really deeply, it starts to open up your, the, the cones in your retina and you begin to see colors that other people aren't seeing uh, yeah. when you're painting. And most people that are painters will say that. Yeah. It's almost like you're on drugs. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really psychedelic, but it almost is in the sense that you begin to see, you're looking at a landscape and you're, lo- or you're looking at something and you say, do you see that color? And people say, no, I don't see it. What are you you're making it up? <laughs> I would, I, um, I took a color course twice, uh, and it was so intense and it made you think of color in basically like three. Normally when you think of like a color wheel, it's kind of like two dimensional, uh, yeah. circular, Right. Uh, but this course forced you to think in colors in three dimensions, almost like a sphere to find the mm-hmm. right color. Yeah. You know, you know and, and like I almost got into a couple car accidents when I went through that, through that time of my life. Cause you were just so sensitive and so oversaturated with seeing and thinking in color that mm-hmm. like you said, you would see things. It wasn't like you were seeing things that were not there. You were just noticing things that have always been there. You just weren't aware of them. And, yeah, and you uh, have to be very careful driving down the road because yes. your eyes get diverted. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah. um, that's, that's cool. Uh, and what, what is it that you, uh, what is it that you love to paint? Well, I started with doing portraits, actually. I went from oh. doing sculpture sculpture busts to doing portraits of people. And then I, after I'd done, you know, a lot of portraits, I realized that if I wasn't doing them, doing them and giving them away, you know, I was an unknown. And, you know, this was a waste of time. So I had this studio that was filled with portraits that I had done, and, and nobody cared about any of them because they'd say, who's that? And even even when you do uh, landscapes, lots of people will say, well, where is that? You know, they want to know mm-hmm. where it is. <laughs> um, so that was a problem. Um, and, you know, I love Sargent. Uh, Sargent's one of my favorite uh, painters, uh, tr- fabulous watercolorists and, thing, and stuff like that. So um, for me, uh, that was really inspiring to do that. But then I began to realize that I needed to do landscapes if I was going to try to be validated and sell some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Because I think selling your art is, is very validating uh, for any artist. Mm-hmm. So that's how I got into landscape painting. And I've been doing landscape painting for probably 20 years. Do oh, wow. you remember your first one that you sold? Yes, I do, actually. I sold it to a woman from Albany, New York. Um, and it was a very emotional uh, thing for her um, and somewhat for me. I had done this painting of this little cottage hmm. uh, down on the bay side of Truro. And it's off a parking lot down there. And uh, I, I like to do skies that are kind of somewhat provocative and things like that. And the light was late late afternoon light hitting the side of this little cottage. And this woman showed up in my studio and said, I I need to buy that. I want to buy it. And she told me this story about how she had been down in this parking lot the year before. Mm. And uh, her husband was with her and she had some kind of an anaphylactic shock and they had to call an ambulance and they she got in the ambulance and he was following her down to Hyannis and he had a heart attack in the car on the way down and died. Oh, wow. Uh, evidently. And this was her last memory of him. 
Hmm. And so she really didn't have the money to buy it. And I said, that's okay, I'll keep it for you. And she showed up, sure enough, three months later in the fall, <laughs> said, I just got a raise, I'll buy it. <laughs> nice. So yeah, I, I remember it very well. Yeah. It's interesting, the emotional um, reasoning why people buy things, you know, yeah. uh, paintings, um, artwork. And um, I think when selling artwork, you know, set up somewhere or whatnot, it, it, it may be beneficial um, in the selling process to allow people to kind of connect and um, emotionally to a painting. Like when they say, oh, where's that? You know, and you can tell them because you're answering the question, but by giving them that answer, it, it, it almost sometimes it could potentially uh, rob them of that connection because they got their the, the knowledge, but they didn't get the opportunity to actually emotionally connect to the to the image. Right. Right. Um, and uh, I remember in Portugal, I bought uh, a work of art for my son, mm -hmm. and um, I really like the artist. Uh, it, it's his designs are incredible but there was this one uh image which was um the title of it was gratitude and i didn't acknowledge it at first but he had the word gratitude in portuguese in the uh in the artwork mm -hmm. um and i it, it didn't click but when it clicked because i was looking for something for my son everything that was there was like really for like my, it was easy to shop for my daughter, but for my son, there was like nothing. I, I couldn't find anything. And then I saw this and, and, uh, my, my son, uh, the word gratitude is like huge for him. Like it's one of the first big words you ever learn how to say. <laughs> and, uh, and so I bought it because the artwork was nice, but it was really just to, um, celebrate this connection uh, yeah. with my son, you know? Yeah, that's really cool. That's yeah. a very big word to actually, you know, you know, like absorb that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, do do you primarily focus on selling your work now, twenty years later, or um, are you kind of using other metrics to to define your success uh, when it comes to painting? No, I, um, I basically, that's a struggle that every artist has to face, uh, whether or not he's going he's gonna to try to paint to please uh, the media or whatever's, whatever's going on out there, or he's going to mm -hmm. paint to please himself and to really just be who he is. And ultimately, that's the people that are really true artists are people that are doing that. There's a lot of people out there that are imitating other artists and things like that and you know that's what you're taught when you when you start studying art you know go into a museum and sit there and and do someone else's art and see and you mm -hmm. learn a lot from doing that i've done it myself but really and truly who you are your own identity comes out in your own art after a while and you have to be true to yourself in order to do that even though it's it can be a long process mm -hmm. And, and but that's that's ultimately what I do, and what I love, what I try to gain in my art is um, is a sense of serenity mm. um, about the whole situation. What I really want people to do that people rarely do is stand in front of a piece of art for five minutes and really look at it. Um, there's very few people that will ever do that. And um, when they're looking that, at it, what what is it that you want them to see? see into it. I want them to see, really stand there and see all the colors that are in there and, and grab the feeling that's coming out of it and think of the place uh, of being in a place like that, be taken in by it in a way. That's what I'm really asking them to see. Mm -hmm. The whole feeling of it. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. Um, and, and do you, do you, paint uh plain air or do you go and you paint on location or or 
both. Okay. I paint. I paint a lot here. The most time, there's so many people here right now that I rarely go out painting plein air unless it's really special day, and I can find a place to be alone. But I don't like people interrupting me or talking to me when I'm doing it. Mm. So in the fall, which when the light gets really angular up here, mm -hmm. is really when you go out. If you go out early in the morning or late in the afternoon, you get tremendous light, and that's what's so beautiful about the whole thing. It actually mm. starts to speak to you after a while. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so, over the last twenty years, you told me the story about the lady with the, um, uh, you know, where, where her husband had the, the stroke and she came back. Um, I'm kind of curious. You know, you you were talking about, uh. That it was the end of Vietnam. You were you were going off to university. You got mm -hmm. you, you got into the military, right? Um, yeah, I, my draft number came up really low, and mm -hmm. I knew they were going to get me. So, um, in order to avoid having to go overseas, I actually joined because at that point uh, they were going to give you rank, and uh, you didn't have to. I didn't have to be in for more than two years, and I could do my own profession while I was in there. So I, no, that's, that's what cool. I did. No, that, that worked out. Yeah. Um, they didn't pay for any of my education at all, but at least I only owed them a couple of years for a war yeah, that I, I really you. wasn't. I really wasn't interested, and in. I was kind of a passive resistor in that war. Um, that's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, so I'm trying to. I'm, uh, there's a question in my head that I'm trying to form, and what I'm trying to get is a, is a juxtaposition um, because I got the feeling. Uh, that as you're painting now, the old life is old life, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'd like to explore that just a little bit, that juxtaposition of where you are right now versus where you were, and mm -hmm. um, and and obviously where you are right now is where you want to be. Um, I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's that's absolutely right. I mean, I have, um, you know, I've done things like a twelve-step program and things like that. So I know uh, where I want to be at this stage of my life, and so that's what I work on. And, mm. and my painting reflects where I want to be, basically, because when I was growing up, uh, trying to make it up in the world myself, nobody gave me anything. I everything I got, I earned, um, mm. and uh, it was a, it was, uh, it was tough. Um, so, but I was fortunate in some ways. I was lucky in some ways. Some things happen to you that are just plain lucky and other things you make for yourself. Most of it you make for yourself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so how, how would you describe the, the difference between, um, uh, you're, you're retired now, you said? Yeah, I retired a couple of years ago. Okay. So when you were working in the uh, dentistry and now you're not, and now you're painting, like, how would you describe the difference of, you know, just the pace of your life, uh, the things that you think about, uh, the way that you feel about yourself? Like, how would you describe the, the difference between the two? Well, it was very intense and very stimulating to learn the profession and to go through the training um, of doing it. But the actual work itself was really, really one of the hardest jobs. I've done a lot of jobs. I had a lot of summer jobs when I was being, you know, going through college and professional school. And I can say, quite frankly, that this is one of the toughest jobs I had ever faced um, mm. because I'm a very kind of empathic, sensitive person. And uh, hurting people was really hard for me. When I was 30 years old, I actually hated myself. Uh, mm. I hated, and I was working in a neighborhood health center in Boston. Uh, so I was giving back to the world. I didn't just go out and decide I was going to make a million. Um, there was many years that I made very little money because mm. I was really, um, I guess I was, you would call a bleeding heart liberal, but my heart wasn't bleeding. I was just liberal and I believed in, in giving back to the, uh, the disadvantaged. Mm. Um, and that from there I started studying kids. I, I was going to be a kid's dentist because I had a lot of issues around 
how kids were treated in the dental office. I thought that the, the dentists that were treating children really didn't have a good background in psychology because I'd been mm. there. And so when I went, I went, I got into the Harvard School of Public Health because I was working in public health and um, decided to cross register with the School of Education and studied early childhood development on my own and wrote a whole bunch of papers on what what and what you should do and what you shouldn't do for a young child in the dental office. And, um, what I felt were the taboos of not, not making, not damaging a child for the rest of his life. And, and it, when you're working on children's teeth, like that mm-hmm. was a, like that was a big concern, damaging, like harming and hurting kids. Yes. It was huh. a very big concern, uh, especially uh, younger kids. There's different stages of development. And uh, I actually was, I had gotten into several programs to be a children's dentist and I had turned them all down because I didn't, I didn't, I met the people in the departments. I'd ask questions about what they do with young children and things like that. And I, so what I did is I took a job in public health in the public health sector. I was actually on staff at Mass General, but I was working at a public health uh, neighborhood health center. And um, it allowed me to see 70% kids. That's why I took the job, because mm. I, I wanted to see if I had the ability to do this, okay, if, it was, if I was going to make me happy to do it. And ultimately, I found out that, you know, three or four bad kids a day could send you packing. You'd get home, and you'd just be miserable, questioning mm. yourself. And, uh, because young kids, especially in neighborhoods where – there had been dentistry done where they just took teeth out and things like that. In those days, they never really talked to children. They never, we've come a ways from that now. I mean, we're talking 40 years ago. Uh, so it was a, it's a very difficult time. And the times we were living in were very difficult too, because there was forced busing in that neighborhood at that time, things like that. There was a lot going on. <laughs> there, there was, there was what? Forced busing, they were integrating okay. the school systems. That, that's what I thought you said. And then my brain was like, well, yeah, okay, forced busing. Okay. <laughs> um, like the segregation, I mean, not segregation, but like where they're moving people uh, from right. different look at, yeah. Right. Um, wow. That's, just, that's interesting. And, um, and so you spent quite a time, uh, a couple of years giving back. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's interesting because, uh, in your voice, you can hear you're, you're very empathetic, right? I mean, I guess they call them empaths or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and it was actually funny because like when I'm trying to picture your timeline in my head. I'm like, this is strange because your voice doesn't sound nearly as old as your age, your, your, the years that you have. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's kind of the, the you know trying to balance these two um, these two things. It's it's kind of funny to kind of step outside of myself and see my head trying to juggle this because um, <laughs> uh, your voice sounds I don't want to say young like in a youthful way, but just um, you know what it sounds like is it's very strange actually. It sounds youth, like very young, but in an innocent way, mm-hmm. right? Um, not in terms of its age, but just in terms of its, uh, um, like there's an innocence or a purity in it, which is very strange. It's what I get from when I hear you speak. Mm-hmm. Um, I, well, okay. One of the things that I had to teach myself uh, about this is to, I had to, first of all, really take it and not take it personally and not become embittered Mm. by a lot of it. Um, But to just take the high road and to try to do the best I could with it. And uh, it was a a very difficult struggle. And you asked me initially in your question, uh, now where I've come, come from. And when you, when you suffer that much, uh, in terms of, I mean, I had to go back and I would be, 
I was a very empathic type of individual, and so people would send people that were very sensitive to me to take care of them mm. in that way. And I was on staff at Mass General for 11 years, and then I moved out, had my own practice, finally. Uh, but it was really almost on the perimeter of their, of their campus there. Mm. And um, so a lot of people that were, a lot of docs and nurses, people that had then psychiatrists had come to see me and they were starting to send their patients to me, which were really, really difficult people. I mean, these were not normal patients that you would have, but having a background in psychology helped me to do, helped me to treat them a little better. And it drove me to go back and start studying more and more. So, you know, I read books about psychosomatic symptoms, uh, from Vanderbilt uh, Medical School and things like that. I read, I did, read a lot of papers and studied a lot in order to try to treat these people. And ultimately came to the conclusion that, hey, this was the best I could do. And uh, that's all I could do. And I was just a human being. And, I, and I, there was only so much that they could expect from me. And so my office manager and I finally got together and we said, what are we going to do? We are attracting all these people and we can't deal with them as they're just taking up all our time. This is not a, you know, an outpatient clinic for people that have, have mental problems. And so we just kind of backed away from the whole thing um, and just kept our core people and uh, just went on from there. But I've always loved kids and actually, um, I changed at, during the time, that time, I was also changing my career in a way. I was getting more and more into orthodontic treatment with kids and going mm. out and taking courses for that. And I spent seven years doing that and uh, just had a major part of my practice as that, which was a lot of fun. And then finally, at the end of my career, I was, I was uh, doing orthodontics for a whole large multi-specialty group practice, which was a lot of fun. So I had come full circle going from kids back to kids, which was great. <laughs> I love kids. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, um, I was writing over the weekend and, and, uh, just really understanding like, uh, as adults, um, there are some of us who work very, very hard at remaining a child um, mm -hmm. not a child in being irresponsible and things like that, but just meaning like, again, coming back to keeping that innocence, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and even though, uh, we have gone through maybe some very painful and horrendous things, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of my personal mottos is to always be better, not bitter. And, mm -hmm. And so no matter what happens, you have that choice, you know, to be better mm -hmm. or, or instead of bitter. Right. And, you have that choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I was just writing about that this weekend, how I think a lot of creatives, a lot of artists, I, I wrote a, um, a, you could say a children's book, uh, maybe about last week, kind of just sat down and wrote it out. It was about a little boy chasing butterflies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and how he really wanted to go into the town, but he just, but if it meant giving up his relationship with these butterflies, he wasn't willing to do it. And, um, and ultimately he went through a process where by helping people, uh, he got to share these butterflies with them and it changed what they were doing, you know, mm -hmm. um, to the point that the town was just covered in butterflies, right? Like mm -hmm. from the tiles to the wh whatever, right? Everything. And, uh, and it wasn't the feel, but at least he felt safe with the butterflies where he and other little boys can now chase the butterflies through the streets. And, um, and I went back and reread it and just kind of did a little editing on it and just realized like, that's it. Like we're, there's this magic in us as almost like children that some, some of us adults work very, very hard at trying to keep that as long as we can. And, and I know 80 year old, uh, artists who have actually done that, you know? So, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's, 
Yeah. So uh, that's kind of some, I, I don't know you obviously, Warren, but um, I'm, I kind of get that sense uh, in you. Well, it, that wasn't something that I consciously did, um, but what it was about was being authentic about who you are mm-hmm. and being true to yourself all, all along the way and not being, uh, not drinking the Kool-Aid of what society wanted to give you and not taking on like, the identity of being a dentist was always, for me, not good. Do you desire to make every painting have deeper meaning, tell a greater story, and be better than your last painting? Well, let me recommend a strategy to achieve just that. I recommend every artist take time to study the great master artists and illustrators and how they composed an image. Uncover their secret design formulas that makes their artwork successful. Now, if you want a little help doing that, I'll direct you to an incredible free resource at artdesignworkbook.com. That's right. I created a 177-page workbook for artists with lessons and drills that will teach you how to see the secret design formulas by master artists and illustrators. So go to artdesignworkbook.com and download your free art design workbook right now. <laughs> so I wasn't, you know, most people grab a degree like that and they stand up and, you know, pound their chest. And uh, for me, it was not like that at all. It's interesting. Hmm. So now your identity uh, is a painter. Mm-hmm. And that suits you a lot better, huh? Yeah, it does. It it suits me a lot better because it fits into my whole neurologic schema a lot better. I mean, I'm I'm a very visual person and also really sensitive to people uh, around me and things around me like that. So um, I have these this natural uh, thing that goes on that I have. I send out my feelers and I absorb what's going on around me. And when you're a painter like that, then that really gives you an added little bonus about how you're going to use it. And it's still developing actually. Mm. So, and and the idea of staying as a child isn't, it's not really about just being a child. It's about an ongoing development. Um, Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say that, you know, when you retire, you're able to go back and and revisit your childhood in ways like that. And you do, you think you go through your whole life that way. Uh, But still, there's still the ongoing development of your own neurology, even though people look at it as a big decline. I don't see it that way. I see it as a chance to, to move, move on to another level. I, I would agree with you. It's, yeah. it's when you're a child, child, and you have innocence, right? And you go through that process of living. The problem is, is you're unconscious about it. Right. Right. So as an yeah. adult, it's not like, hey, we, we want to go back to being a child where you're unconscious of what's going on. It's like, no, right. in the darkest darks, you get to choose. You're conscious. And so you can consciously remain uh, a, a, a spot of purity or a spot of light, a spot of love, a spot of mm-hmm. innocence, a spot of joy in the midst of whatever the chaos is. And right. it's, um, you know, and and someone from a distance whose eyes have narrowed with, with age and, and things have to be, you know, concrete or this or that, they might look at someone like that and say, well, that person's a little off or aloof or whatever. And, and, uh, and that's okay. But from where you stand and you're looking at your own eyes, it's done with, a high level of deliberateness and, mm-hmm. and consciousness. And that, consciousness, yes. That, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, uh, yeah. You know, I, I would well, consider I up, a great I grew privilege. up in the age of consciousness, kind of. You know, <laughs> okay. People were doing a lot of acid and mushrooms and, you know, marijuana and all kinds of things were going mm-hmm. on. Right? So even when I was in the Air Force, out, I was out uh, outside of San Francisco uh, watching all the body bags being brought back from Vietnam uh, and laid on the tarmac, mm. I would be going into San Francisco, and it was, you know, it was those were the days where the hate was wild. <laughs> so mm. you got both both sides of the whole thing. It's pretty crazy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, I've, let's put it this way, I've never consciously <laughs> engaged in uh, mushrooms or LSD or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I have people who I care for deeply uh, who have encouraged me uh, to try mushrooms. Um, yeah. And so it's something I haven't ruled out yet. Uh, yeah. But well, Michael, I, but, Palin, Michael Palin is coming out with a book. You know, Michael Palin's books, I don't know if you follow him at all, but uh-uh. he talks a lot about nutrition. He started out with about nutrition, but now he's coming out with a book basically on psychedelics, which are a lot of mushrooms and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I, mean, I, haven't it's, it's read, I haven't read thing. it yet, but I read the review on it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a huge thing now. It's like a lot of people, a lot of uh, psychologists and, and people, you know, that you um, – like people I, I've, I've followed and respect um, who are great thinkers, you know, um, very disciplined people. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they're not promoting it like, let's say, mushrooms. They're not promoting mushrooms in the sense of in some reckless abandonment and, you know, like, you know, foolishness way. Um, but really as a way of – connecting to a you know to, to to yourself you know it's kind of from what i'm seeing and hearing it's kind of like a way of of kind of putting the warp drive on you know <laughs> it, and it can be it can be that and I, I, don't get me wrong i'm not promoting any of that i don't really do uh drugs of mm-hmm. any kind um in, including pills that a lot of people like to prescribe um so that's not my my mo in life but i think that um, that's a good, that's a way of starting to look inside yourself. And I think that's what it does. It facilitates yeah. a look inside. And, and just for anyone who's listening, uh, there's this great, I, I love the theory of it. I say you just don't know if there's any facts in it necessarily. If you don't, you don't know if it's necessarily true, but there's this, um, idea. What was, I forget what they're calling it, but basically the idea is that when, uh, pre-man was walking around um they began to eat these mushrooms that um gave them these trips i think it's called stoned ape right um well, theory yeah if you read carlos castanatas it's all about stuff like that yeah okay yeah, yeah. and i and i just found that so fascinating i'm like mm-hmm. that makes total sense you know in the fact mm-hmm. that it 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 gave you two things which i think is very powerful which is courage Mm-hmm. Uh, which is this ability to see danger and fear, but then, then with inside yourself to actually push through that. And then mm-hmm. empathy, right? Like mm-hmm. the ability to connect and love, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> now, it's, it it uh-huh. really helps people, I think. People are so... Um, it's a kind of an ADD media environment these days, and people mm. are not what I would call into really taking the time to reflect on yeah. what's in, what's in it, what's in there. And that's probably more than anything, what I try to do with my pain mm. to have you stop. It's almost like a hypnotic moment. If you can, if you can relax long enough to look at it, you know? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's basically what it is. It's, and it's the more primitive side of the human brain, really, when you really come down to it. Uh, you know, getting into a hypnotic trance itself is is uh, <laughs> stimulating part of a very very ancient part of our our brain system. It's interesting because it could even you know we want to say ancient or old or primitive, mm-hmm. but it's kind of strange because it, it actually just might be the human part of us. You know? Yes, um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because you can be so, you can. I really think that people could be with uh, all the obsessive compulsive stuff that's going on. People working seventy hour weeks. People, you know, you can get so deranged um, and think that your reasoning is so right. Yeah. Uh, but but then when you get back to the really fundamental parts of your of your of your life, then you begin to realize how wrong it was. And I've been there. I know what I know what you're mm. talking about. I like that, um, you know, you were talking about slowing things down <clears throat> and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> we were just talking about this over, over on the campfire, which is interesting. Um, 
about slowing things down. Like, you ever experienced that when, like, when you were a kid, maybe even as an adult, you're laying on a floor or something, you're looking at a ceiling fan, mm-hmm. and it goes yep. super fast, and all of a sudden it's like, Phew, and it just slows down, and you catch it. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I know what it was. Uh, my 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 nephew, he's going to be heading to college this year in, uh, in, this, in, this, in the fall, and so he has to read this Greek tra- tragedy book or whatever for – and I suggested to him, I said, if you really want to like get it really quick, just copy everything, mm-hmm. put it in a text doc, and then have it read it back to you, but three times fast. Mm-hmm. And it takes about 20 to 30 seconds for your brain to adjust to it. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden, like it's, it's super fast because it's three times fast, but your eye follows through the entire thing. Mm-hmm. You hear 95% of the words, right? And you comprehend it. It's your brain adjusts at this super fast level. And uh, and you can go through so much information and, and still get it. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. That's one of the cool things about the fact of, of <laughs> us being human beings. We have, a, we have a neurology that can be very fast. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> faster than faster than we think <laughs> you know it's actually something i teach um uh, when i'm working with artists is i have them do a trick like not a trick but a an exercise and i tell them i say you know grab a piece of paper or keys or something and then throw it maybe three four five feet in front of you and wherever it lands what i want you to do is to jump from where you are to where that is And they all do it, right? It gives them a little physical exercise, right? Boom. Mm -hmm. And I I say to them, I said, what's fascinating is that the brain in a moment was able to analyze gravity, your weight, what muscles you had to use, like the amount of force that needed to be released, you know, to, to, to propel you off the ground that distance at that speed like all of the math that was required and the physics that was required i mean scientists are just starting to make things jump right Mm -hmm. but the body does it like almost instantaneously the mind does it It calculates all of this math Mm -hmm. and um and this is I use that to, to explain to them the importance of taking time when you're crafting a work of art mm-hmm. to manage the invisible parts of the art and the, and the math that's underneath it because the brain calculates things so quick. And if you don't give the brain what it needs, um, then all of a sudden when someone looks at the work, it may be pretty, but it's off and the person knows it. Mm-hmm. If they don't know it consciously, like mm-hmm. they can't tell you how they jump, but the fact that they can go through all of that physics and mathematics and actually achieve it, it's the same thing when we look at a work of art and, and, and so we'll say, yeah, that's nice, you know, but we know it's, it's, it's not, it's not a masterwork. Because when you look at a masterwork, a masterwork has a certain feeling. It feels like there's a, a a heaviness, a completeness, a weight to it. And, and uh, one of the reasons is, is because the math that's underneath it is, is, is correct. And um, it, it, you know, it took me 20 years before I would actually say the word math because I'm not a math person and I know that scares most artists. Um, <clears throat> but there's a psychology to, to, to creating a great work of art. There's math that's, that's required in great works of art. Um, but, but yeah, being just a, aware of it. Mm-hmm. That, that The idea of math brings up this. I went to see this uh, exhibit by Rene Magritte mm-hmm. uh, at the San Francisco MFA, uh, the San Francisco MoMA, excuse me, just before I left uh, San Francisco this year. And um, he is probably one of the, he was, first of all, he's a surrealist, um, but he's one of the most clever surrealists I've Mm. ever encountered in terms of his humor and everything that he uses. But he uses a math in a way that when he puts things to different sizes on a canvas, Mm -hmm. 
you're suddenly struck by it and you stand there and you look at it and you can you you keep looking and you keep looking and it gives you this feeling like oh my god <laughs> is this what he really had in mind and it is it's just amazing and you but if you just pass by it if you have to stand there a while to really get the full impact it's about his he's a very very clever man and you know everybody looks at dali like dali was the be all and end all of of the surrealistic movement but man this guy was just incredible wow that's cool you have yeah. to send me his name so i can take a look at the, the his work yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> well most people i had not, most people when you see his work you've only seen a couple of pieces but this mm-hmm. was a 50 50 uh, there were 50 pieces in this it was a whole wow. retrospective on his life which really put it together quite beautifully yeah wow that's awesome um when you're sitting in that place in your painting be it in your studio or out uh, outside um and you step into that moment of stillness uh what what's going on inside of you in the in the moment like do you, can you even articulate that well when I start, uh, first of all, I think that um, what I like to create is a state of mind in my painting. Mm, okay. So I begin with that alone. Okay. In other words, something will strike me as being something that's incredibly beautiful, or it makes me feel a certain way. And I, then I have to evaluate it and say, well, is this paintable? Can I capture this? Am I capable of doing this? And how am I going to do it? Um, and then when I first step up, I don't, first of all, I never sit down when I'm painting. I'm always standing. Uh, mm. I move a lot. Sometimes I play music. Sometimes the music is part of the mood that I have. Mm-hmm. I play either, it varies from classical to all kinds of music because I, I love music. Um, but then the process really gets directed towards how do I capture this light? How do I capture the feeling of what, what I want to put, put down here? Uh, and I'm realizing now that uh, some people, everyone has a different subjectivity to how they view art, everyone. Uh, it's a very subjective uh, profession in, in itself, uh, the, way, the way the world views it. Um, and if you're going to paint the way someone, you think someone would like to view it, it's not going to work for you. What you have to do is evolve into the, and I think I said this before, evolve into seeing it differently and mm. evolve into experimenting differently and, and, and being able to take risks. Taking risks is a really important in art. Um, not, being, being, not being afraid to make mistakes, uh, things like that is really important. Um, and then having the, the self-confidence to be able to do it. And I think most people... That's, that's the most, that's the biggest barrier that most people have in doing art, uh, self-confidence. Mm. I remember, and it's also giving yourself a gift, uh, you know, having come from the dental profession, uh, it's a very, very, uh, constrictive, uh, obsessive compulsive life that you're leading. And I would come home and I would uh, work on the weekends. That's for years. I just worked on the weekends. I had a small space that I worked in. And I would have to kick myself to get out there and give myself the gift of opening up and doing this. Mm. And it took me years before I could do it, before I could actually just without, without even thinking about it twice saying, yeah, I'm going outside. I'll be back. Cause it was out in a, it was an old uh, part of a, my garage that I used to work in. I said, that's how I started. Mm. And, uh, it is a, it's, it's a gift that you have inside yourself that you need to just nurture and let it come out. That's what it is. And so when you start a painting, that's what you're doing. You're basically looking at it. And what I do is, for example, uh, I look at everything from an abstract point of view. It's almost mm-hmm. like a math problem. Mm. Um, you look at how you're going to paint it. How's, how does it look to me? How does it really strike me? And then I look at it in black and white. I'll, I'll do it in charcoal. Sometimes I'll do it in pastel mm. to play with the colors that I think are, are going to give it what it, what it needs. And, uh, 
that's the whole process. How do I, how do I get it out of me? How do I, you know, it's almost mm-hmm. like, in a sense, it's almost like writing a poem. I don't it know is. if you've ever written, written or done poetry or read a poem, and suddenly you get to the point in a poem where you're getting a real meaning and you're going, oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And that's what it's like. You get to that stage where you go, oh, wow, I got it, you know? <clears throat> mm-hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a really multifactorial type of thing that you go through doing it. There's a, a neat little technique I'll share uh, with this podcast so anyone who's listening it can uh, benefit from it. Um, I call it the body language technique. Mm-hmm. And it's just based off this, the, the idea that when you're communicating – only 7% of the, you know, of communication is actually the words that we use. Mm-hmm. And 93% is tonality mm-hmm. and body language. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, we tend to think about in audio communication, where we're communicating with our voice. But as a visual communicator, I was like, huh, I wonder if that's the same principle. You know, like, mm-hmm. you know, if we're communicating writing an essay, writing a poetry in a visual poem, right? Making uh, visual music. Um, the, the, the question I was asking was um, what we see at the end, the context of what we painted, could it only be 70, I mean, 7% of what is actually communicated? I, I believe it can. I, I really think that it's that's what makes it so difficult, um, because you know, not not every painting is going to be your best, and sometimes you'll get one out of five that you like, um, and you'll be able to capture something that often, and and that's part of the struggle. It is a struggle, believe it, it or not. It, it, people, it is a people, struggle. Yeah. <laughs> I, I but uh, the the body language technique is this. Um. If you're out there and you see something and, and you before you actually paint it, um, I don't know if you pull out your cell phone and record yourself or have a mirror or or just like just being very very uh, self aware and in mm-hmm. tune with yourself, but just speaking, just articulating what what you saw right mm-hmm. that caught you, but not worrying about your words, just speak it but being mm-hmm. very, very conscious, almost as if you're stepping outside of yourself, watching yourself, mm-hmm. watch your body language. Because mm-hmm. your body language will actually give you all of the visual clues that you need to accurately mm-hmm. communicate that feeling. Mm-hmm. So, you know, let's say you're looking at a tree, the way it's against the um, the background of the sky, right? And you're mm-hmm. articulating that. All of a sudden, your hand moves in this really cool little gesture, and it's, it, it might do this little diagonal thrust, you know, that's kind of like mm-hmm. um, communicating this idea that the trees are all vertical, but there's this diagonal that's breaking out, causing mm-hmm. this contrast. Like when I just said the word contrast, I saw my hands go back and forth, you know. Um, and what's cool is I, I do it so many artists, and you have them articulate the same thing. and the body language almost all the time is exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's one of the things that we do to hack our paintings is to communicate it in body language first, extract the, the movements of that body language. Mm -hmm. And then whatever it is that you're drawing, let's say a, a scene, we then cloak it to the underlying design that actually came from the body language. And, Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to, it seems to work so far. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, and so I'll, I'll just throw it out there. It's just a way of, 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 of having a different approach, a different perspective and actually getting uh, really, really in tuned um, with how you truly, truly feel about mm-hmm. that moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's, um, that brings up, uh, what I was doing last night. Last night, I I took my surf casting pole and I took my wife with me. And we went 
to watch. We went to the sunset to fish, mm. and it was an incredible sunset. And fishing wasn't great, but we stood there, and it was the reflection off the water. All of it. It was something that you just took in. And mm. I didn't have my phone with me. She took she took some pictures for me. But that's the kind of thing where you're standing there and you're just taking the whole thing in visually and emotionally. Yeah. Uh, you're standing there and um, it's all happening over, say, a half an hour mm-hmm. at least because the sun is going down and things like that. And it's, you're getting different colors in the sky that are reflecting off the surface of the water as well. Um, the wind is there um, as well. The surf is beating against your legs. I had a pair of cutoff uh, jeans that I was, because I didn't want to wear waders or anything. I rarely wear wa- waders. And I was, I was wet up to my waist. <laughs> uh, so that's, those are the kind of moments. And there's only, I think, even though you're in there, physically in there, when you go back, if you were going to paint something like that, like I would do something like that and take seven or eight, photographs of that that time period and actually do drawings Mm -hmm. of it to capture what i want out of it and then go back and look at some of the photographs grab some of those colors and say these are the most meaningful colors that i saw in that time Mm. um yeah that's the kind of that would be the way i would approach something like that and uh, from a physical to a to an actual you know diagrammatic you know kind of way Mm -hmm. so yeah that's cool. That's cool. So um, when, when you're creating your pieces, um, do you do you feel a connection between like your psychology training and, and what you're achieving in your work? Mm, I feel... I don't feel, I don't think about my formal training in psychology or anything like that. What I feel is who I am in relationship to what I've done. Like okay. I, uh, I, I had an opening on Friday night, uh, as I said, and one of the paintings uh, I had almost finished last fall and I came back and finished it uh, when I came back. And it's just a, a very, what you would think is a very simple painting of an old fashioned wooden boat. That's actually cl- uh, looks like clabbers on the outside. And it's, it's just sitting in a very, in a tide pool with a, with a, uh, something to tie it up with, with the mm-hmm. background. And it's, and it's early morning and it's just flat. And it's just a picture of, how you feel about the age of that boat, the age you're at, the the place you're in, the serenity that you have around it, the light that's hitting it from all sides. And I just named it an old friend, hmm. you know, because it is, it's my old friend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's the kind of connection you have. The psycho- the psychological connection for that is, a, for me, was a kind of a personal, but also an everyman kind of thing that you can, that you could relate to that way. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the, and the aloneness, the, the singularity of you being that one object, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Expound on that a little bit more. Well, you know, ultimately when you're on this or when you're leaving this earth, you're going to, go alone and you're mm. you, you were born alone and you're going alone oh, you weren't really born alone but you were uh, a singular entity um but everything that is you is really in the end you alone um and if you're not comfortable with that with that person if you haven't learned to love that person to love everything, everyone that gave you who you are and things like that. And also to recognize that you are 99 and 44th percent, uh, just like everybody else in the world, then you haven't really progressed. You haven't really come that far in life. And I think that's what the progression is. uh, And that's the, uh, I shouldn't say the joy, but that's the reality that a lot of people, 
who live long life, I think, maybe may come to. Some may not. Uh, there's an awful lot of people that get stuck in their own little neurotic um, areas of life, and it just becomes entrenched for them. Mm -hmm. But there are people out there, uh, very, very uh, intelligent people that you that you will that people search out and find and read that um, see those things. I mean, it's 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 an interesting idea um, because sometimes you see these words like singularity or oneness or even even wholeness. Wholeness is a little bit different, but like say oneness, um, and it can throw you off a little bit because in its core, you think it, it kind of makes you think of individualism. You know, like um, one meaning one entity, right? Mm -hmm. Or single. Um, even the word alone, aloneness, right? Like that you're alone, you know? Yes. And and on the surface, that's what it would look like. You know, I was just thinking this, uh, I guess it was yesterday, about the only thing that you have when you come into this world and when you leave this world is your body. Mm -hmm. Like you don't even have clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like – there's nothing that you bring into this world and, and leave this world with. And the only thing that you do or connected to is your body. And you can't even say that's true because every seven years you replace it. Right. So it's not like you leave with right. the same body you came in with. Right. All the cells are different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, same DNA, but different. It, yeah, well that, yeah, same DNA. <laughs> but when you said about singularity and, I, and, and you know, in, and I started thinking, wait, like, if you, if you, if we go deeper in that, there's a strange reality of like, the fact is, is like, there's a sperm cell and egg cell, right? Like, mm -hmm. one by itself doesn't do anything, right? Like, so even like, right. like, it's, it's the oneness or the singularity is really the relationship of all these things, right? So like mm -hmm. we have millions or trillions, let's say trillions of cells. Um, but it's only when they all work as one, mm -hmm. do, do, do they function? You can function through them. You know, I mean, that's what cancer is, right? Is when they're not working and it's kind of shooting off and being rogue in a sense. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, think about leprosy, it's kind of like a mutiny in a sense, right? The body's kind of compelling itself. Um, but I, I just, you know, just for a moment when you said that, I was like, you know, there is like this oneness of the individual. And, and maybe... Yeah, we, it, mm -hmm. we all have it. We all have that oneness. Um, uh, but we we tend to be looking out outside of us more than looking inside of us and, and reflecting in and out, in and out, you know, um, uh, John Lennon, I think said, mm. uh, something about, um, the love that's going on within you and without you. Okay. And that's the kind of reverberation that is really going on with us all the time, whether we recognize it or not. And it's, it's, um, it's really, That's really awesome, important. man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because the, the, like, even the word without is one of those words that you could take depending on where you're standing yeah. and say, oh, it's, it, it means to isolate and, and to leave me alone. But, or it just means the love within is yeah. active and the love outside of you is active or, mm -hmm. the, you know, without or within. It, that's, yeah. that's interesting. That's um, an interesting little play on words. Mm -hmm. Um. Wow, that's cool. That's cool. Very, very cool. Uh, so, Warren, let me ask you, five, ten years from now, mm -hmm. uh, you're out there with your wife. This time you brought your cell phone or maybe your camera glasses or whatever they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, But five, ten years from now, where would you like to see you as an artist, you um, – in your work being? Well, I'll tell you that what I see myself becoming is I'm a bit more of a, an ascetic uh, person um, 
<clears throat> there were years when I was actually in the Air Force, I, I did a lot of, I really wanted to become a monk <laughs> mm. at that stage of my life. Um, I read a lot of Alan Watts and all kinds of things. Uh, I, I was ready to enter a monastery at that point. I really wanted to try that. And I knew, you know, this is, you know, this can't be real. You know, you're just playing around with that. But I really, um, I like meditation. I do meditate uh, not as often as I'd like to, but I was, there were times in my life where I did a lot of it. Um, and I think as I go on with my life, because there is a slowing down as you age, you just don't have the energy that you used to have. So you have to kind of pick your battles. And, you know, when you're painting as a painter, <laughs> It really is a struggle. And so what you have to do, I've learned that I'd take bigger strides painting if I really stop for a while, for maybe a week or two, take mm -hmm. a breath, and really look inward and start thinking about, go to some other exhibits, think about what you've been doing, think about what you want to, what you're really trying to accomplish, and what you're trying to, what kind of an effect you're trying to lay out there. And that gives you more in the long run. So in 10 years, I really don't know where I'm going to be, but that's my, my process right now. That's where I'm going. That's where I see myself going, to be more, uh, uh, more individuated, I think, probably than ever, uh, and, and focused on, on the, inward, the inward and outward process of uh, living. Hmm. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. So let's talk about, um, I have to ask you a question. Um, and it's going to be a totally different angle, totally different direction than where we were going. But uh, it's something I ask everyone. So I'm going to ask you now. Um, what is it that you like to eat? <laughs> oh, I have an Italian mother and I love Italian food. Let me tell you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's what I really love. Yeah. So, now, did she teach you how to make anything? I just watched her. Okay. <laughs> you nice. just sit on the counter and watch. When I was a kid, I would just sit up on the counter and watch her. And you learn a lot just doing that. She was a really good cook, too. Mm. so yeah what was something that she made that you were just like oh my gosh like you did not want to invite your friends over because you didn't want to share like, <laughs> oh no i would invite my friends over and i would just kind of <laughs> muse at them and they would go oh what's that <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> but if you're if you could have your mom make you something today what would uh -huh. be the one thing that you would love for her to make you again Oh, she used to make, uh, she'd make really good pasta. I mean, my dad was not Italian. He was uh, from a different ethnic area altogether. He was a meat and potatoes guy. Um, okay. But <laughs> um, I loved peppers when I was growing up, fried mm. peppers, okay? Mm -hmm. So any kind of peppers, you know, red peppers, whatever, they all have a different, slightly different flavor. Um, mm -hmm. You know, eggplants, um, eggplant parmesan, things like that. Uh, just, you know, interesting things like that. Um, I've had raviolis that have just plain raviolis with uh, uh, artichoke hearts mm. ground up inside them. Okay, things like that. Delicate things like that. Wow. So, yeah. Any, you know, there's a lot, a lot of creativity that goes into... Uh, Italian cooking. Lydia is one of my favorite Italian chefs. I used, I never meet, miss her on TV when she's on because she's from, oh, she's yeah. from actually almost from Yugoslavia. Her parents uh, came from that area. So she's a uh, Northern Italian, but my mom is a Southern Italian and uh, mm. I've been to Southern Italy and I know what the cooking is like down there. So I'm a, I'm a strange blend because I'm also not a full blooded Italian. So I'm, I'm you know, I can appreciate everything. <laughs> Where's your dad from? Uh, my his part of the family was from Germany and England. Okay, very yeah. cool, very cool. Oh wow, it's funny you said Lydia. I remember watching her as well. 
Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Lydia Bastiani is really a character. I think yeah, I really yeah. enjoy watching her. Yeah. She, she, uh, I remember her saying, do not put oil in the water when you make the pasta. Then, <laughs> right. then the sauce doesn't stick to the pasta. And I'm like, that is so brilliant, right? It makes so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, things like that. Things as simple as that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> So um, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So how can uh, how can people get connected with you? Uh, well, you can email me. Um, you can find me on Facebook. Um, if uh, you're interested in uh, coming to see me, I, as I said, I'm on the Cape. Um, I can't accommodate people if they come here because I'm just not set up that way. But. Uh, I'd be happy to see people. Uh, you can always come to my studio. I'm very open and I'm very honest. You can come in and just hang out for a few hours and ask me questions and things like that. But, um, you know, I can I can give you my email. It's uh, wfgreen824 at comcast.net. And uh, you can just send me a message. Cool. And I'll put that in the show notes so that people have access to all that. And, um, sure. And you guys can connect then. Uh, Warren, it was great talking with you. And yeah, thank you. Awesome. Great. It was great talking to you, Don. I really appreciate it. Um, it was a nice conversation. I, I really enjoyed the different aspects and how it went. It was, uh, it was nice, nicely done. Beautiful. Great. I yeah, appreciate talking to you. Do you desire to make every painting have deeper meaning, tell a greater story, and be better than your last painting? Well, let me recommend a strategy to achieve just that. I recommend every artist take time to study the great master artists and illustrators and how they composed an image. Uncover their secret design formulas that makes their artwork successful. Now, if you want a little help doing that, I'll direct you to an incredible free resource at artdesignworkbook.com. That's right, I created a 177 page workbook for artists with lessons and drills that will teach you how to see the secret design formulas by master artists and illustrators. So go to artdesignworkbook.com and download your free art design workbook right now.